This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Sports Interaction. Sports Interaction is your homegrown sports book where local takes on an entirely different meaning, focusing on the teams, games, and players that matter to you. Sports Interaction is on the ground on top of all the local trends, offering prop bets you'd never even imagine existed. And now introducing The Locker Room, the first of its kind in Canada, a live watch party for the biggest games of the week, providing in-game betting tips built directly into the app in sight, a groundbreaking dual screen experience. Sports Interaction, your homegrown sports book. Go to sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN to open an account. Bet local. 19 plus, please play responsibly. If you have questions or concerns about your gambling or the gambling of someone close to you, please go to connexontario.ca. Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? Powered by Sports Interaction, your homegrown sports book. Always remember to bet local. Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ, big news to start off our Thursday. Uh, Ottawa Senators forward Shane Pinto suspended. Uh, for 41 games for gambling related infraction like it's a big a really big bomb to start off our Thursday how do we get to this point we know he was still looking for a deal and all of a sudden this is the big story where do we start with this how did we get here well it's obviously a bombshell I mean it's not too often you see a player get half a season suspension in this case it's a pretty dramatic twist uh, because previously when we talked about Shane Pinto We've been talking about his new contract. I do think that there's a few things to separate. I mean, first of all, the reason he wasn't signed to start the season, I don't believe, is connected to, to this investigation. I, I think that that's something Ottawa's learned about in the meantime and probably explains, you know, why the deal didn't get done maybe by mid-October. Um, but, you know, the, the Sens didn't have the cap space to sign him, and that's why he wasn't in, in the lineup on opening night. You know, as for what we know about what he did, this is a weird situation, right? I mean, I'm sure by now... You, you've seen the press release the league put out. The, the, the key takeaway from that is that Shane Pinto himself did not bet on NHL games. Uh, you know, he still gets half a season suspension because of that, which I think is a pretty strong indication of how the league, um, you know, wants to protect the, the the game. And, and you know, I think that we can infer that had he bet on NHL games or if anyone else does in the future, that 41 games would be the, the minimum. It would, you know, you're likely looking at a longer suspension. And, you know, because the league didn't provide a lot of details, you know, what I can tell you from my reporting is is it's a difficult one to unwrap. You know, it sounds as though what I can say confidently is that a betting partner flagged an issue here, um, that there was a third party involved, so it wasn't Shane Pinto himself betting, and that this was a very nuanced and intricate case that I think took, uh, you know, a long time quite a long period of time for the NHL to unravel, to investigate, to figure out what was going to happen. And ultimately the league, you know, makes it clear that, that they found that he didn't bet on games, but, and that they considered the case closed unless they get new information. So I think that's the best I can sort of say for where we're at. I, I realize that a little bit incomplete, right? I mean, the only thing in the CBA, Julian, is article 14.2 says players can't bet on NHL games. It's totally legal for NHL players to bet on Major League Baseball, the NBA, college football, the NFL, you know, what have you. Um, you know, that that kind of thing is allowed. And so it's a bit of a strange one with how it was worded in that press release. Yeah. It, it, for The next question I have is, how do you feel about the lack of details from that press release? If, 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 if he didn't bet on NHL games, why are we even in this situation? Well, because I think it doesn't say that no one else – bet on NHL games that is connected to him. I think that that's the missing link. But I, I don't want to take that any further because I, I quite honestly don't have all the available information. It sounds as though some of the, the parties directly involved in this uh, have signed confidentiality agreements. So I don't know, you know, let's fast forward six months from now and we're, you know, I don't know how much we will know. I, I think a lot of that will depend on if at some point Shane Pinto, uh, you know, wants to get into this with, with a reporter in some way and, and wants to discuss what happened. I don't suspect you'll hear the league or the NHL Players Association uh, expand any more on it than is already out there. Um, you know, it, it does, though, point us to, based on the reporting I've done, that that um, Shane Pinto was, you know, involved with a third party. And there's obviously something that violated the league's policy. And, and you know, one of the key tenets of the league's policy is that you can't bet on NHL games. 
Right. So why does the 41-game suspension, I believe it starts retroactively to the first game of the season, why is it starting at that point and not, you know, I guess assuming the next game or whenever he signs a contract? Well, I think we have to view this as, as a settlement almost more than a suspension. You know, I can tell you that Shane Pinto is not going to appeal this. You know, this is this has been agreed upon to a certain uh, degree. And I think a lot because it's a very unique circumstance, too. I think that a lot of this had to be discussed. I mean, when, when you step back and look at it, it's really only Shane Pinto that's that's getting knocked here. Right. I mean, he's he's obviously serving a pretty uh, big suspension. He's, he's not going to be paid for that half season. Uh, obviously misses a half season of what tends to be not the longest career. So, I mean, this is, it's, it's would be difficult to say anything other than this is extremely punitive to him personally, but you know, the senators, uh, you know, come out of this where, you know, they were in a cap bind, right. They didn't have the room and still don't have the room as we're recording this today to sign Shane Pinto to, to the kind of contract I think that, that he was looking for. And so, you know, at this stage, um, you know, I think that we what we should understand is that there's maybe some, you know, extreme circumstances or, or specific circumstances that led us to where we're at. There's no real reason now for Ottawa to sign Shane Pinto before January 21st. That's when his suspension is up. And, and what that means in kind of plain terms is a team that has a, was going to have cap issues signing him gets in almost three more months to, to resolve those cap issues in one shape, way, shape or form, whether that's another trade. I mean, maybe they, they run into a long-term injury situation between then and now that gives them that cap room. Uh, but they do get a lot of time to kick, kick the can down the road and figure out, you know, how they're going to work things out with Shane Pinto. I don't think there's any agreement done. You know, I've seen some suggestion. Oh, maybe they just force him to take his, his qualifying offer. Uh, you know, they may try to do that. I, I don't know the answer there, but I, I don't think certainly there's anything to suggest that Shane Pinto's comfortable with that. He's not necessarily just going to sign that that deal, you know, come January, because remember, he's still coming off a 20 goal season. This is not mm -hmm. a great, great set of circumstances, obviously, for for a young man. But he's he, he's negotiating his next contract based on what he's done as an NHL player and what he projects to do. And so, you know, there's still a fair bit to be worked out on that end of things. But, you know, the senators do get time here. Um, you know, the player obviously has to serve as punishment. And, and you know, come January, I would expect uh, you'll see him sign a contract and join the Sens at, at that point in time. That's just still a wild story just to follow. I know you've been you've been doing your best to report on this. Uh, just, I guess, what's next for Shane Pinto at this point? Because it could just be the qualifying offer or nothing. I'm really curious what's next for him aside from serving that suspension. Well, you know, it is interesting. It sounds as though I think that, that the Senators have been very supportive of Pinto. Um, you know, since they've learned of this, they caught wind of this investigation before most of us in the public did, of course. And I think that that, you know, the parties are in a good place in terms of, um, you know, where they're at with each other. And, you know, because of that, uh, you know, I would say that, that that's a, probably a good place to start if you're negotiating a contract, uh, right? Especially because it didn't come easily. They didn't sign them in August or September or in the lead up to opening night and all that, that point in time. Um, and, you know, now he's, he's obviously going to have to keep himself in shape as best he can. Uh, I would presume he'll be skating on the side. I mean, is it any suspended player, you know, you're, you're basically barred from team activities. And in his case, doesn't even have a contract. So it's kind of an even more unique situation and circumstance. And then, you know, ramp up for, for January when, when, you know, a contract can be done. But, you know, this is a, a pretty major setback um, for someone still getting his feet under him in the NHL. I mean, had a great first full NHL season last year. You know, it's a step back for the Senators, too, because they're denied the chance to have a young player as good as Shane Pinto in their lineup. But, um, you know, it, it seems as though he's accepted the punishment that, that you know, as far as I can tell, the, the relationship is good with the team. And, you know, the, the Senators have put out and, uh, you know, release on this day saying they stand by the player, that they're going to help him through this time. And so, you know, I, I do think that, that that is a positive in this, in a sense, that, it's not as though the relationship between team and player is totally broken here. And I think that, you know, ultimately you're going to see Shane Pinto be given another opportunity to, to, to play in the NHL and to, to learn from whatever mistakes uh, were made here. What a tough week for the Ottawa Senators between this story. I mean, it was already seemed like it was kind of wonky as it was with the really weird goalie pull situation with Anton Forsberg, the games that they've lost to this point where it seems like the fan base is, they're definitely not happy with how uh, how things are going with the team. Uh, uh, not to kind of delve into teams with slow starts, but you could look at teams out west with that. But the Ottawa Senators were already kind of in a really peculiar spot up until this news, Siege. 
They were. I mean, look, it's been a it's been a little down most recently, I guess, with the team that they, they did. They, I mean, if we had it done this a week ago, they were up, right? I mean, this is yeah. It's it's funny how the roller coaster ride goes for so many teams in the early going of the season. Um, but I, I I don't think that uh, you know I, I don't I don't think that that this is is going to help things. But you know, look, that's still a team that's got to prove itself. That's trying to show itself as a playoff contender, and and you know they know now they they have certainty here that they're not going to have. Uh, Shane Pinto in their lineup before you know late January in Philadelphia, and and even then, you know, I think that it's it's reasonable to ask what version of him will they get? Just missing that much time, you know. I think the only comparable in recent years is is the William Nylander negotiation in Toronto that took him all the way to December first before he signed. You know, he joined the, the team after a period of time where he got back into shape with practices and the like, and had a season that's that's probably stands as the worst of his eight year NHL career at this point, because it was so hard to get up to speed. I, you know, I'm not predicting or saying that will 100% happen in the pencil case, but I mean, it's reasonable to think that there is some comparable there that it's just hard to mimic, um, you know, the, the activity it takes to, to be, you know, joining the league at, at midway through the year too. everyone else will be going. So you know, I think in, in a lot of ways for the current team, this, this will, you know, in a weird way, remove a question, like, is he coming, you know, what's going on here? And, you know, they're going to have to get it done without him. And, and you know, they've, they've played pretty well in some games. Uh, and then more recently, it's it's not gone their way. But I think, you know, by no means should we expect it to be easy for them or anyone else. Any team looking to climb their way up, I think they're, you're going to have to just have the lulls not be so long. And, and that's what Ottawa will be focused on here in the, the immediate future. We'll, we'll keep with the lulls. I know we jumped right into the Shane Pinto topic. There are other stuff we're going to talk about on today's show. Uh, the fallout from the uh, Pride tape ban being reversed. We had a conversation with Travis Dermott earlier this week. Uh, the vote on decentralizing the draft. We'll touch up on that as well. Maybe a small update on, on Connor McDavid when it comes to his health and the potential of him playing in the Heritage Classic game. Uh, we've got to get to Puck Doku uh, because that was something that uh, you and I have been uh, dealing with over the last two weeks. Uh, but I do want to ask you, on the because we did plan on talking about the Ottawa Senators and the fact that they weren't off to a good start, but also some other teams that have not started well. But there are some teams that are unbeaten, too. We should talk about these teams before we get to break here. Uh, well, you know what? We'll, we'll go positive, and then we'll end with the, the slow starters here. But in terms of Vegas, Colorado, and Boston, those three teams are undefeated as we're recording right now. Is there a team among those three that sort of impresses you the most in terms of their hot start? Like, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. It's got to be Boston. I mean, and, and that's no disrespect to Vegas, Colorado. I mean, Vegas starting unbeaten out of the gate, you know, coming off a shorter summer and winning the cup and there's no hangover and all that stuff. Like, that's great. Colorado getting back and they're doing it too without Gabriel Landis Cog, of course, for for a second straight year. But, you know, Boston losing the top two centers on their team to retirement and, and Patrice Bergeron and David Krejci. You know, they're now rolling, you know, Pavel Zaka and Charlie Coyle out in those spots with Matthew Poitras. Pardon the... Uh, pronunciation there new new player on their team you know also actually i'm glad you said that because i'm not sure because you know what i had no idea i had no i don't know anything about matthew patras Patra, or i'm saying his name wrong i have i have no idea about his story where he's from so i wasn't sure if he was actually like a franco quebecois guy or franco Altarien or whatever like i i had no idea no, so thank I, you for thank you for being brave well i know but i'm not sure i got it right because he's from ontario he's near from the gta uh so okay and he played played in the ontario hockey league for guelph so you know, it could I, be Plotris. We're gonna. It could be. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to get a ruling on that because this guy looks <laughs> like he's gonna. But he looks like he's sticking around, right? I mean, he was a bit of a surprise in some ways making the team. So I'm just saying the Bruins starting this way, we shouldn't maybe be surprised. But come on, come on. They did it last year, Jeez. and I think if you if you just zoom out really quickly and think of the last say five years, like they've lost Zdeno Char to to you know he went to another team or another two teams and then retired. And now they lose Bergeron. They're losing Krejci. Like they're not just lo- they're, like they're losing key members that that built the foundation. And it says something I think really powerful that they've still found a way to to keep that that true culture. As I say, I've said before, like every single team in the league talks about establishing culture, building culture, this or this or that. I think the Bruins have arguably among the current generation of teams that they, while they haven't won a Stanley Cup since 2011, I mean they've had a lot of opportunities. They, they've won presents. Uh, trophies that they, they went to game seven of the cup final against St. Louis a few years ago. I mean, they've consistently been a top tier team, no matter who they've lost and how things have changed and evolved with their team. And so I, I do think that they've, 
for me, they've been the most impressive. I, I wasn't picking them to miss the playoffs necessarily, but I, I, you know, maybe, and I shouldn't maybe overreact to six or seven games either, but I, I did think that they might have a fall off and I guess they still might, but, but it doesn't look that way based on the early goings, not just uh, their record, but the way they've won those games and, and, and some of those things. And so I think Boston's the biggest positive surprise for me, which sounds crazy, right? Cause they had a historic regular season last year, but they lost some pretty key pieces. Absolutely. What about on the, on the other side of things with teams like a Buffalo at three, four and O uh, Pittsburgh is at the bottom of their division at two, four and O as well. Uh, the Calgary flames are it's, a lot of people are panicking over there, but I mean, they're still fourth in their division. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers, obviously uh, much worse, much lower down the list at one, four and one. Uh, is there a team that started off slow? I mean, it's probably the Edmonton Oilers in this case, but just that's kind of really caught your eye and has given you a lot of thought to to think about. Let's not overthink it. We were talking yeah. about Edmonton winning a Stanley Cup this year. Again, Seriously. Still could happen. Still could happen. But but you know, it's hard to deny the first couple of weeks that that, you know, it's it's gone from bad to worse with their performances, uh, with the goals against, with with losing Connor McDavid, which is, you know, beyond what you can control as a team, but they're they're in a tough spot. And so I, I think that their start is probably the the most surprising and uh, with a negative tinge to it for me, but you know I'm not I'm not smashing the panic button just yet. I the, the casing is still over that big red button as we're recording this today. Okay, yeah. Uh, by the way, with Connor McDavid, I believe Jay Woodcroft spoke earlier this morning. Uh, he said he skated on his own, and there should be an update on his condition after tonight's game against the New York Rangers. Still holding out hope, or at least some people are, uh, that uh, Connor McDavid will play in the Heritage Classic game on Sunday against the Calgary Flames. I still don't think it's going to happen. And I, I, I think some of that, some of whatever is being put out there with that, it's just to kind of drum up a little bit of hope. I mean, I know uh, there's still a lot of seats available for that game, uh, but I, I'd be surprised if they, I mean, then again, you know what, if he's healed, if he's ready to go, he's ready to go. I would be surprised if he was ready for that game. I don't know. I, I, I I'm a little less skeptical. I think it's important for him to try to play that game. And so he's going to do everything that he can. You know, what it'll come down to ultimately, I, I believe, is a decision from McDavid himself about where he's at, how he feels. Um, you know, I think it's it's within the realm of possibility he plays. Like, I do think mm -hmm. that's within a window where he might play. But, you know, when it, it's going to come to how he probably feels on, on Sunday when he wakes up and, and how if he does escape that day, like, how does he feel after that um, and and make a call from there? I mean, it's it's a weird one because it's it's the first month of the season, right? Like, it's look, at, it's a big event. I'm not taking anything away from it. I think it's cool. But the flip side of this is it's it's a long year. If you're Connor McDavid and the Oilers, you're you're. I mean, I look. I know they got to win games now because of how they started, as as we're getting at. But you know how important is it really? Um, you know, just given that the fact that that you know they want to be playing important games in April, May, and June, and ensure that his health is in a good spot then. And so I think that there that will be having to be balanced. And I think ultimately the player himself will make the decision, assuming he keeps trending in the right direction over these next couple of days. Well said. We'll take a quick break, and then when we come back from that, we'll talk about the uh, decentralized draft. It doesn't look good for us to go to Vegas, my man, or at least not for us to see any of those uh, free uh, front office personnel if we go there. And uh, the fallout from the uh, pride tape reversal in your conversation with Travis Dermott. Welcome to You Can Bet That. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. CJ, uh, there is a really interesting uh, really interesting bet on the Sports Interaction website. Mitts off, paddles down. Goalie scrap. Will there be a goalie versus goalie fight this year? That's at 8.00 on the Sports Interaction website. What say you? I'll say this. What is the fascination with the goalie on goalie fights? Like, I feel like that's fun. I feel like it's like a real point of, of interest for fans. And I, I've never totally got it. You're not a goalie fight. Well, when I was a kid, like I, I remember Felix Potvin and was it was Ron Hextall at the time fighting. It's kind of a famous one that you've seen replayed since. But, uh, you know, as I've maybe as I've aged, I'm, I'm less, less curious. But I suppose, look. The odds of it happening, I'd lean to no. We just don't see as much fighting in today's game, and I don't know who's going to get in that fight, but uh, what do you think? Uh, look, Jordan Bennington still plays in this league. 
it's possible. <laughs> That's as far well, as I'm going to go with that. <laughs> there's, I mean, look, there's like, what, 1,100, 1,200 games left. It's certainly possible that you're drawing from a huge sample size. I just, I don't, I don't think it's that likely. I don't think it's that likely. That's fair. Maybe other people share uh, your same loss of childlike innocence and wonder, CJ. And don't forget yeah. to check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. This episode of The Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by SeatGeek. With 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. There are more than 70,000 events every single day on SeatGeek, including concerts, sports. I'll talk about the Heritage Classic going on in Edmonton this weekend. Festivals, uh, artists like Travis Scott and Zach Bryan are on tour. NFL, NHL, NBA, everything you would want, all available on SeatGeek. They put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure you're getting a good deal. Each ticket is rated on a scale of 1 to 10. So look for the green dots. Green means good. Red means bad. And every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee. SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. All you have to do if you want to get a good deal, use the code Johnston for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code Johnston. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Get ready for the first ever live and in-person Game Over head-to-head matchup as Game Over Edmonton and Game Over Calgary get together at the Pint near White Avenue in Edmonton after the Heritage Classic. Come meet hosts Avery Lewis McDougal, Dennis Lee, Zach Wheel, Audie James, and Peter Klein, as well as special guests Andrew Berkshire and myself as they break down the game right in front of you and on the broadcast. After we finish the broadcast, the party starts as the hosts of the show will meet and chat everyone, tell stories, and have a great time talking about your Edmonton Oilers and Calgary Flames. We can't wait to see you there starting at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. And we have a special treat courtesy of our friends at Temperance Brewing, as those who aren't drinking alcohol will be treated to a variety of non-alcoholic cocktails, brews, and spirits. Join us for Sober October and have tons of fun. CJ, we spoke on this podcast about how weird it was for the nhl to put out this ban on pride tape and there are other specialty causes that were in danger as well but pride tape on hockey sticks that seems to be the big topic and we've seen we've since seen a reversal we saw travis dermott defy the ban and when it got to a point where the league was just in this corner where they couldn't decide between punishing him or not they decided all right we're not dealing with this anymore. I loved your conversation with Travis Dermott of the Arizona Coyotes uh, earlier this week. You spoke to him uh, for the athletic. Could you tell us about that interview? Could you tell us about your conversation with him, why he ultimately decided to do what he did and ultimately decided not to push further on, on what he was doing? Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, I, I can tell you the NHL, I don't believe ever really considered punishing Travis Dermott. Uh, my sense from conversations I had uh, with those in the league office is they they understood where he was coming from. I think he had a stronger leg to stand on in this case. I mean, look, for a lot of reasons, you know, we've been open that we didn't think this bench would ever been in place to begin with. But this is a cause Travis Dermott himself has supported uh, going back many years. You know, he he had pride tape on the shaft of his stick, um, you know, when he was in the American Hockey League with the Marlies. And so, you know, and, and continued, you know, through his time with the Maple Leafs, the Canucks, and then ultimately chose to, to put it on the stick last Saturday uh, in the game that, against Anaheim. You know, I think for, for Dermot himself, you know, what he told me is that he has someone very close to him um, that, that, you know, told him that, that they are gay and they remain closeted to this day. But, you know, when that happened, clearly it struck a chord of them. That's, that's partly, I think, what really compelled him to, to show the support he has for the LGBTQ community uh, over years. And, and you know, ultimately, I think this was a really important matter to him. And so he didn't tell anybody. He went to the rink. It was an afternoon game on Saturday. The reason it didn't come until the fifth game of the Coyote season is because he didn't actually have any pride tape. Uh, he had misplaced what he used to have in a move uh, in the offseason from Vancouver. And so he he ordered his pride tape. It arrived in time for that game. He said it wasn't long before the game. He just put it on the shaft of his stick the way he'd done in the past. Didn't tell any you know, the equipment managers, his teammates didn't prepare the PR staff or the, the GM, the coach said he played the game. Nobody commented on anything. And then, of course, you know, we all saw it in, in some of the pictures that started to circulate on social media at that point in time. And by the time that game was over, his phone exploded. And so you know, I think it was a pretty anxious weekend for Travis after that. 
just not knowing. I mean, let's, let's underline this here. This is a player on a two-way contract. This is a player that, you know, doesn't have a, a firm standing in the league. He's played, you know, a number of years in the NHL, but he only played 11 games last season uh, because he had some significant concussion issues and, and uh, issues pertaining to, to um, the symptoms he had after those concussions. And so, you know, he's trying to reestablish himself in the league and didn't need to do something like this. You know, if it was someone with uh, a little bit more security, whether that's financial security or, or a grip on a roster spot, I think uh, it would be one thing. But the fact that it was someone who had a lot to lose, you know, was pretty strong. And so, you know, where that got us to ultimately is, is I think everyone started looking at this and it's just like the, the, the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, he was the tipping point. Like the league put this rule in place essentially in June, but it clarified its position just before this season started. And, you know, from that point in time, uh, it, there was a lot of heat on the league, but, but they weren't going to change. They weren't going to reverse course until Dermot ultimately, um, you know, put them in a situation where I think they recognized they had to do something um, by doing nothing. If, if they just let it pass and, and didn't do anything, which I, again, I don't think they ever really wanted to, it just led to the point where now we, you know, that, that rule has been rescinded. It's completely voluntary. It's actually kind of funny how it's worked out, Julian. In, in the past, mm -hmm. when players wore pride tape, it was largely sort of unofficially just done in warm up. Uh, the the rule that's now in place, or because this rule has been rescinded, you know, players are allowed to show um, you know support for their causes in games too. It's not just practices or warm ups. I mean, this is this is there's no there's no limitations here. Um, so you know, conceivably, and I, I don't know if anyone will do it, but but we might start seeing more and more players use pride tape even in games which really wasn't done too often in the past. I know there was a few one-offs, Jonathan Huberdeau, and maybe a couple other players, but it wasn't a typical common practice that might become more typical or common. What I'm, what I'm curious about is if Travis Dermott had any thoughts on on how players initially responded to this. Because one thing that makes his his what he did so brave and, and so cool was that there were a lot of high-profile players who spoke about the, the, the ban, essentially, and they – expressed disappointment but there were some guys who said you know what they wouldn't uh they wouldn't try to defy it i, I don't know if if travis got to speak on that but i would love i would have loved to have known how he felt about that well he said he was emotional when when the news first came out about the nhl and what was being done he felt like his voice was being taken away to a degree and uh, clearly wrestled with the decision to get to the point where he ultimately did what he did you know this is a player that that i don't think in any way was looking for attention if you know what i mean like it's a, it's a difficult spot to be in. You know, he clearly takes pride in supporting the LGBTQ community. You know, he said that since he's be become more of an advocate in recent years, he's ended up having a lot of heart to heart conversations with people. I mean, being known as someone who is supportive the way he is, it, it, you know, has has basically opened the door where he's he's had uh, more insight into to what members of that community deal with. And, and he said, basically, if, if you don't see an issue, it's easy to ignore it, essentially, that that he's met a lot of people, he said, that are either uncomfortable in their bodies or made to be uncomfortable because of who they're interested in or who they're not interested in, depending on how you want to look at that, and that he feels it's important uh, for those people to see him uh, supporting them. And, you know, he said to me, too, I don't even know, if I don't think this quote made my story, but he said, you know, I've had time to think about this. He's like, so I was born as, as a man who likes women, but it could have easily been any other way, you know, basically that, that this is, um, you know, he just thinks it's crazy um the way this is all gone and so you know it was important to him to keep supporting obviously an individual close in his life that that maybe initially got him you know supporting that community but then now he knows a lot more people in the community he's been more active in it and you know you know in a strange way this is he becomes a trailblazer i really think by accident um you know this was a rule that that was ill-conceived from the beginning and it's pretty rare for the NHL to do an about face and something like this, right? To completely reverse course in the manner that they have. And so, you know, let's not let's not gloss over the significance of what Travis did and and you know the role he played in ultimately getting us to where we should be. And I think that's where we can feel happy today. You know, we might not have seen an, a total outpouring just yet of players wearing pride tapes since the rule was rescinded. That's because teams didn't have it anymore, right? It was illegal. And so I think you're gonna see a lot more of it in the, the weeks and months ahead. Um, you know, on player sticks or, or what have you, because, you know, now the, the the floodgates have been open, so to speak. And I would imagine there's a lot of orders being placed uh, with that pride tape company. It seems like the next step after this is, is just how people have 
have reacted to the league reversing course because you're right. The league essentially did the right thing in getting rid of the ban and, and putting in his, putting us all in a position where we can see tape during games. Like when it, that, when that does actually happen, that's supposed to be a good thing, but there are definitely people who have seen the actions of the NHL and they're just saying, well, why have you been flip flopping all this time? Like one comment in particular from, from our colleague, Eric Stevens, uh, who wrote, uh, who also got to talk to Travis Dermott, but also got to speak to Matthew Dumba. Uh, this is what Matt Dumba had to say about this. The league's going to do whatever it wants to do, and they don't really think about the meaning behind things. I think they try to lay it out in whatever format work it works best for the league. Why is that even a thing? Why did they have to do that in the first place? You'll never get the answers from them. You'll never get the answers for that. That's just something I've come to understand. They don't have answers for a lot of the things that they do. They follow and try to save face. And while there's a part of me that wants to give the NHL props for doing the right thing, Matt's not wrong. They literally did this to save face. This shouldn't have been a thing in the first place. The NHL ultimately is still going to draw criticism for doing all these steps and jumping back and forth for a situation that shouldn't have been a situation in the first place. Agreed. I mean, I can't say any more than that. I think it's a massive unforced error. I think they recognize that. I don't have the exact answer. It's hard for me to understand. It's like the, it was a, a solution without a problem, in a sense. I mean, pride tape was always voluntary. You know, I think that the issue of the sweaters is actually different because, you know, and we don't need to go down this road, but but the idea of the sweaters is it was sort of being forced upon everyone to have to wear them. Look, I don't think there's any harm in anyone wearing it. I'm not taking that side, but it is. it was a little bit more, it, it became a story, but who didn't wear it? Fair enough. If you If you want to step back from that, I don't agree with it, but I can I can actually be empathetic. To, I can understand why they get to that point. But something like Pride Tape was always voluntary. Why take away the, the ability for those that want to support the community in that manner to do it? I mean, it, it was it was an overreach. It was a misstep. It was a self inflicted gunshot wound. I mean, I'm not saying let's let's congratulate them now, but I I mean we have to acknowledge they have at least got to the right place um, where they should have been all along. And and we can at least through this. Uh, while I know that Travis Dermott has been supportive of the LGBTQ community before, I think a lot more people out of this have developed a greater sense of appreciation and respect for Travis. Just the, just the comments you were just mentioning about him, and, and just him realizing that there are people who, you know, are they are who they are, and him realizing that, like that feels very forward and refreshing. From to hear from a hockey player, considering the stereotype that follows them of people who you know don't bother to follow what's going on in the real world beyond their bubble, it's it's really refreshing to to know that Travis Dermott seems to have some kind of conscience. Like it's it's I'm glad that you were able to talk to him and you were able to follow up with him and you were able to 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 just get his thoughts on everything going on. So just hopefully people have read it. Yeah, it took, yes, it took a lot him. of courage, and he acknowledged he knew his career in some way, shape or form could be negatively impacted um, by that. But, you know, clearly he sees the bigger picture. I mean, you can imagine how hard he must have worked and all the help he got along the way to reach the NHL. That's a pretty privileged position to get to. But, but you know, I think he was willing to sacrifice that potentially for something he thinks is even more important. And, you know, I know he's not the only player out there that's like that, but he's the one in this case that that stood up and defied this specific um, rule and and I think he does deserve credit for that. By the way, you joined the Athletic last Monday, and obviously, you know we're really happy to have you at the Athletic. But I'm just looking at your page right now, Siege. So you've covered Travis Dermott and the Pride Take Ban. You 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 were right on the Shane Pinto uh, situation, which we talked about at the top of the show. You've been on top of the decentralization of the draft, which is what I want to get to next. You good, man? Like you, you, you've been putting out banger after banger after banger since you joined. It has not stopped for you. Are you okay? Well, uh, you good? I'm a little tired, if I'm being honest, but I'm not going to complain. Yes. I mean, this is this is what I'm here for. This is what gives me juice um, covering big stories. So it's it's been it's but it's been a whirlwind. Like it. You know, I don't want to make this about me. I mean, I guess I can make the CJ show about me because it's got my name on it. But I mean, in general, I mean, yeah. let's face it, these stories are are important stories in a lot of ways, or or big things happen around the league. But it's it's been it's been funny because I have a lot of sort of what I might call maybe more featurey type of stories that are in the the can and and ideas that I want to pursue. 
but almost all of them have been shelved, you know, from the initial days of taking over there just because, you know, things are coming up now in the meantime. So um, let's hope we, we have a little more period of quiet and I can do some other stuff that, that maybe isn't all so, you know, carrying the, the sort of gravity some of those, those pieces have, but um, yeah, it's been, it's been nice. And honestly, I feel super welcome too, which is, which has been great. I wanted to pump your tires there, but oh, I did so. also want it to serve as a funny transition over to the next topic, which is the fact that the NHL draft will be decentralized. We've talked about it on the show before. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on how it affects our jobs. The one thing I'm just really curious about is, well, there's a few things I'm curious about. How soon could we be at a point where these changes could take place where we're not going to see dozens of front office members for each team at these drafts? And and what does it mean for the fan experience, for the television experience? Do we even have a location in Las Vegas for next for, for 2024? Where are we at? Well, I'll say this. I don't know the exact vote total that was taken in the ballot of the 32 teams, but I do know the league was surprised about how strongly the sentiment was for change. And, and so, you know, I think that there's still a lot that has to be ironed out here. But I, I do think that that does create the scenario where we might see this, you know, brought into play away. I mean, if, if you if you've pulled your clubs and you know that the vast, vast, vast majority of them want to, you know, basically see a change to the way the draft is done, and you don't have a, a location locked in for June 28th and 29th, 2024, at least at the time we're recording this, why not just institute it right away? And so, you know, the, the league itself hasn't got to that point, but I wonder if this propels them pretty strongly in that direction. Um, just because, you know, it does sound like it was pretty overwhelming that that teams, um, you know, were in support of, of going to a draft like we see in the NBA and NFL. Um, you know, one thing I've heard a fresh comment, maybe c- compared to last time we talked about this on the show, is that, you know, some people with the teams actually think this will put a little bit more attention on the draft picks themselves, that, that there could be a positive uh, kind of outcome here that, it, you know, the draft sometimes becomes a little bit about all the trades and, and action that way. It's not to say that we'll completely be devoid of trades, but it might be dominating the discussion a little bit less, leave the floor more to those those draft picks who will be in a centralized draft location when this is said and done. But there are a ton of logistics. That's one thing the memo that went out Wednesday to teams made clear is that there's a lot of logistics still to be sorted by the league. So, you know, what I would say is it's a little too soon for us to say is this happening in 2024 or 2025, but it's pretty clear it's happening. And so either you get one more in-person draft or maybe you've had your last one, Julian. Uh, but that's that's kind of where it stands. And you know, look, this is this was a rather democratic process. I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think that the teams found that the combination of travel cost uh, to be not worth it compared to what you know the, the having your main personnel at home uh, can do. You know, well, the the draft picks themselves are in the centralized location. Here's the thing: I like watching drafts. If it gets to a point where I have to watch the NHL draft from home. I will live with that. Here's my thing. I like watching the NFL draft because there's a player near the top, whether he's the first overall pick or if he falls to five or 10 or whatever, that's just interesting, right? They they have the talent, but maybe they've said some stuff day before, a couple days before that makes them interesting. Or maybe I've seen them play college football, just their personality, the way that they are. They are interesting people. The NBA and the NFL drafts have the success that they have Because the prospects themselves, whether it's the way that they look, whether it's the things that they say, whether it's the things things that they've done, there are things that make them interesting. And while I can understand that people would like to see more of an emphasis on the personalities of these prospects kind of shine through for these drafts so they could be the stars of this, it's on the players and the prospects to do this. And, And not to generalize here, but hockey players, unfortunately, have been given this bad rap. Of and, and, and it's valid, they're, they're not that interesting. So, if we're going to be at this point where we're going to decentralize the draft and we're not going to make it a focus about general managers making trades or who's going to get signed in free agency or whatever, and we're going to focus on these kids getting drafted, we're going to have to do a lot better than making either Macklin Celebrity or Cole Eiserman look good. We're going to have to, and media and then the players themselves and the culture and all that, there needs to be a, dis- a, a distinct change on how these players show themselves and show off their personalities in order to make the NHL draft a TV event. Adam Wilde has been saying for the last how many days, how, you know, the, the, the NHL, they need to make the, the draft a TV event and the NBA and the NFL has done that. 
And a big reason why is because the prospects themselves are personalities that are fascinating people and are intriguing to look at. And look, it's also going to mean that, you know, we also see in the NFL draft, sorry, specifically the NFL draft, the NBA a bit too, but it happens a lot where a guy that we think is supposed to go five, six ends up going like later on in that draft. And we put that camera on that kid. There's going to be kids going on in the NHL draft. We're going to be focusing on them. They're going to have to live with that. that There's going to be so though. many different things. That happens. It does happen, Shane but Wright. like it's not. Shane Wright, we're only two years removed from him. Like that was what a big thing. That's like there. a one. That doesn't happen all the time, though. And even then, Seth like, Jones it's not going to. Seth Jones fell to That's... four. Yeah, but like that didn't move the needle. I mean, even Shane Wright was a little bit more notable with that. But like those, that doesn't move the needle as a pure TV event. And ultimately, my whole point is, if the NHL is going to do this and they want this to be right, steps need to be taken for the players to be more interesting. So that way, when we see another Shane Wright situation, it's a much bigger deal than what we make, than, than how we make it, considering what the personalities are like. I hope I made sense through that. You made sense, but here's the, the counterpoint that's just blaring in my ears as you're saying all this. Sure, please. You can't make someone what they're not, right? You can't, I mean, I think you can create hopefully an environment where more and more players feel comfortable showing a little bit more of their personality. But, you know, I, I just don't think that a lot of especially really young players have that in them. I mean, part of what makes this sport great is the focus on team, the we before me. That is part of objectively what I love about hockey. The problem in sure. that, of course, the negative aspect of that when you take it to the far to this end is that it also does lead to some of you know the issues that we've seen in the sport. And I think in this case, you know, having players not want to sort of puff out their chests or, or you know, not wanting to stand out for those reasons. I, but this is an issue I, I do think that, that the Players Association has sort of started to share with, with the players themselves that, you know, on some level, if the more exposure you get to Connor Bedard or the, whether it's a Trevor Zegras, some of the younger players comfortable showing this, probably the better it is for the sport, right? The more, if we can get Jack Hughes to, to, to keep, being the way he is and, and with obviously how great he started the season, like that, there's, there can be more salesmanship done here that I think helps everybody involved, especially in a world where you're sharing income between or revenues rather between the players and the owners. I don't even need a kid to puff their chest out. I'm just totally cool with them telling us they like something other than hockey. And the bar, the bar's really low as far well, as I'm concerned. It is low, but let's face it. The younger generation it is, is different too. The younger generation is going to be different by nature. They've been raised differently than than me, of course, but even you. And let's hope, let's hope they're coming with some heat for us. I, I I'm I'm hopeful. I, I do think I think that honestly, decentralizing the draft. This is like this issue doesn't get me fired up. Honestly, I've been to like 15 drafts. I don't care if I go to another. This isn't about me. But I do think what this change does is it, is it does create an opportunity to do things totally differently, right? That's that to me is the benefit. I think it, it there is an opportunity here to make this better TV. Because I don't think the draft in the NHL, well, as fun as it is to go there, I, I don't think it's it's traditionally been that great as a television product. And I think there's an opportunity now to change that. Uh, I, look, if it comes to a point where that's what it's going to have to be, I'm going to have to live with it. I need to see tangible change before I really am, am feel invested to feel that the, the NHL draft as a TV product will actually get better. I feel I've made a, my point on that, but I'm glad we were able to have that discussion because I think it's a, it's a discussion worth having. And I think both of us in the positions that we're in, we play a role in having those personalities shine by talking to them and doing interviews with them and telling their stories. So I'm, I, that's part that's part of the equation in terms of making the NHL draft a more appealing product as it changes. But uh, yeah, I'm glad we're able to have that discussion. I'm glad you've been able to cover that story. You're telling you again, you've been. You've been killing it since you joined us. Uh, uh, joined us here at the Athletic. Too um, kind, my friend. Too yeah. kind. Um, we got to talk about Puck Doku. Uh, over the last two weeks, you and I have been battling uh, with our respective Puck Doku boards, and uh, we had a competition set to to figure out which between our boards would have the lowest uniqueness score. Uh, you won, and not only did you win, uh, you proceeded to taunt on social media by saying boom roasted also we learned you watch the office you do watch tv congratulations yeah i even like the british <laughs> office better than the american one so that's how wow. maybe that's the side of how old i am but I, I actually saw the british office series before the american one was released and i'm kind of partial to it because that's the first thing i saw so yeah it's a good I mean, series i was happy to come out on top i never doubted my ability i gave it 110 percent 
And, you know, I just trusted in the process, Julian, that, uh, that the users out there, that the, the players of the game would find my board a little more amenable than yours. And, you know, I'm just happy to get the two points here in the, a big battle. I got to say, uh, I, I thought I had a really good board and, and a really good theme with mine. And, uh, you know, just Luke Robitaille, I really wanted to just pay respects to one of the best goal scorers in the game. And I uh, was really happy that I was able to be on that board. Uh, I, I, I got to say for the world championship part, uh, I didn't expect that people would be so confused with it. There were a lot of people messaging me wondering why Drew Doughty couldn't count for that. He was a silver medalist in 09 at the World Championships. But uh, look, you know, you, you live to fight another day. Uh, you know, the, the boys will uh, will get up for tomorrow, the next game, and uh, we'll figure out how to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've got new good news for you, too. Sounds like there could be an opportunity down the road for us to do something similar again. So you you will oh. get your chance at revenge. I don't know when. Uh, obviously, we'll let a little time settle here and let some other quiz masters uh, come in and, and set up an, their own boards but uh you you will get a chance to make amends for your gaff by putting world championships uh golds in as one of your your boxes world championship and world junior hockey championship two different things people uh, but in all fairness man i mean I'm, I'm just happy i was able to do this and i was able to uh just be part of this with you man uh shout out to taylor dixon in charge of puck doku uh, who also, well, not also, he is the thing that made it possible uh, for us to have that competition. So, yeah, be on the lookout for us doing more with Puck Doku if the opportunity arises. And with that, we have reached the stick taps portion of our Thursday show. Do you have a stick tap, sir? Yes, sir. My my stick has pride tape on it this week, and I'll tap it for Travis Dermott. Uh, we talked a lot about Travis on the episode, so I don't need to say much more than that, but uh, we'd be pretty remiss if we didn't uh, acknowledge you know, the role he had as the big newsmaker of the week. And uh, the fact that he didn't have to do what he did, but uh, I think that the greater good was served because he chose to do the right thing. I like that. And I think that's suitable enough to be mine as well. Good 10 call. out of 10, no notes. Good call. With that, we'll be back uh, next week with a brand new episode of the CJ Show. Subscribe to the podcast, however you listen to podcasts. Leave us a five-star stunner rating. Uh, whether on Apple, whether on Spotify, uh, leave us a like on the YouTube videos and check out some of the other SDPN content, whether it's the Steve Dangle podcast, Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh, uh, some of the other great shows there. The Jesse Blake Sports Report is another example. Great program. Great show, Jesse Blake. He does a great job on that show. In all seriousness, it's actually a really good show. You should listen to it however you listen to podcasts and uh, send in your questions for our show with the hashtag AskCJ, whether on desk on Discord or on the app formerly known as Twitter. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long. Enjoy the Heritage Classic this weekend, and peace. The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction, your homegrown sportsbook. Always remember to bet local. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter, at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie, at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.